Just two days after the invasion of British-held Malaya in 1941, Japanese troops arrived at the town of Jitra. There they faced a British force determined to halt their advance south. But in a remarkable day of fighting, a handful of tanks and troops routed an entire division and pushed the British defence of northern Malaya into collapse. This video is sponsored by Blinkist, a reading app that condenses some of the best non-fiction books around into easy to digest 15 minute summaries. More on this later. As the sun rose on the morning of December 8th, 1941, the Commander-in-Chief of the British Empire's Armed Forces in Malaya, Air Chief Marshal Sir Robert Brooke Popham, was under pressure. During the night, reports had come in of Imperial Japanese troops landing at Kota Baru and in the Thai ports of Singora and Patani. Brooke Popham's closest fighting force, the Indian 11th Division, was forward deployed near the Thai border, waiting for the order to advance into Thailand to confront the Japanese as part of Operation Matador. But it had been a long night, and indeed a long couple of days since the Japanese invasion flotilla was first spotted. Two days of indecision on whether to execute Matador or not meant there was now no hope of denying the use of Singora and Patani to the enemy. After taking more time to review fresh air reconnaissance, Brook Popham made his decision. At 11am that morning, the commander of the Indian 3rd Corps, General Sir Lewis Heath, was informed that Operation Matador was cancelled. General Heath was furious at how long the order to cancel Matador had taken. His troops had stood waiting for orders all night, only to be told now they were to stand down and retreat south. British communications in Malaya were poor. It would take a further two and a half hours, a full 12 hours after the landing of Japanese troops, for the 11th Division's commander, Major General David Murray Lyon, to receive his orders to retreat to fortifications at the town of Jitra. Precious time to dig in there had been lost, while the division had sat around waiting for Matador. One part of Matador that was to be carried out was known as Krokol. This group had arguably the most important role to play at the start of the Japanese invasion anywhere in Malaya. It was tasked with occupying a crucial choke point inside Thailand known as the Ledge. If enemy forces bypassed this position and then went on to reach the road south of the town of Kro, then the British defences at Jitra would be encircled and the entire defence of northwestern Malaya unhinged. The Krokol advance began at the much delayed time of 3pm on December 8th, 14 hours after Japanese troops had first landed. They got off to an immediately bad start. Not only did one of the two battalions assigned to the task fail to arrive in time, the other, 3rd Battalion, the 16th Punjab Regiment, ran into roadblocks manned by enterprising and hostile Thai policemen. As a result, the British force did not reach the town of Betong, barely five miles across the border, until the evening of December 9th, a full day and a half later. The following day ran more smoothly, but five miles from the ledge they were suddenly engaged by the vanguard of the Japanese 42nd Infantry Regiment. Japan had won the race to the ledge and the 42nd Regiment quickly set about mauling the unfortunate Punjabis, driving them back across the border. To the north, things were not going much better. A small mechanised delaying force, referred to as Leikol, drove across the border on December 8th. They held a position 10 miles into Thailand at dusk on December 9th. When an armoured Japanese column arrived after dark, Leikol ambushed and halted it. But no sooner had the trucks and tanks stopped moving, Japanese troops leapt out and began an aggressive envelopment of the small force opposing them. Within minutes, the British force was swept into a retreat that would take them all the way to Jitra, destroying bridges as they went. It was the kind of bewildering, morale-sapping defeat which British forces would become all too familiar with over the next two months. The landings at Singora and Patani on December 8th had brought large parts of the Japanese 5th Division ashore. 
the aforementioned 42nd Regiment had pushed towards Crow, while from Singora the 11th and 41st Regiments headed south at speed. They were supported by a battalion of tanks and another of artillery. After the defeat of Leiko, there was nothing now between the Japanese and the British defences at Jitra. Around the same time as the Singora Column was easily overcoming Leiko's attempts to stall them, the Indian 11th Division's troops were arriving to find their defences on the so-called Jitra Line, still mostly a building site. For the next couple of days, the troops would spend long hours digging out trenches and fortifications in the pouring rain, preparing for the oncoming storm. The 6th and 15th Indian Brigades were strung out along a 12-mile line to the coast, with the 28th Brigade in reserve to the south. To delay the Japanese and to give more time for defences to be prepared, a Punjabi battalion was sent to create a blocking position at the village of Changlun. This was 10 miles north of the main line, which centred around the town of Jitra and its key road and railway links. While the troops dug in, the RAF was making plans to abandon the airfield at Alor Star after heavy Japanese bombing of it on the morning of December 9th. General Murray Lyon had no idea this was happening, and the first he knew of it was when his own troops reported explosions and fire coming from the airfield. The ground staff had taken a scorched earth approach, despite the fact that troops from 11th Division were actually relying on stores being kept there. Nobody from the RAF had thought to inform Murray Lyon of what was going on, despite the fact that the whole point for 11th Division holding at Jitra was to protect the airfield. Early on the morning of December 10th, the reconnaissance regiment of the Japanese 5th Division, under Lieutenant Colonel Shizu Seiki, contacted the forward elements of the 1st 14th Punjab Battalion north of Changlun. Seiki's mixed force of tanks, artillery and motorised infantry quickly drove the fighting into Changlun itself, where the Punjabis dug their heels in for the rest of the day. The 15th Brigade's commander, Brigadier K.A. Garrett, asked for reinforcements. The first of three available Gurkha battalions from the 28th Brigade was deployed to take a position at Asun, about halfway between Changlin and the Jitra line. After dawn the following day, Colonel Seiki renewed his attack, managing to dislodge his stubborn opponents in the afternoon. The Punjabis fell back towards Asun, but at about 4.30 the Japanese tanks caught up to and overran the battalion which was in marching order and not expecting the enemy to have advanced so quickly. The 1st 14th Punjabs were scattered and took heavy losses. Around 200 men would rejoin the British by the next day, but the battalion was effectively eliminated from the battle. The tanks were halted outside Asun when an anti-tank rifle knocked out the leading vehicle, but a subsequent attempt to destroy the road bridge into the village failed when the detonators became too wet. As a result, Colonel Seiki could resume the attack at 6.30 and meet with great success. The inexperienced Gurkhas had not long been in position and could not cope with the tank's speed and firepower. The Ford companies were quickly overrun and the battalion then annihilated, with more than 500 casualties taken and a loss of anti-tank and mountain artillery batteries. There were further equipment losses when a bridge over the Perlis Road in the west was destroyed too early, leaving two companies worth of vehicles, anti-tank guns and artillery on the wrong side of it. Meanwhile, the Japanese advance carried on, with Seiki keen to press home his earlier successes. He had reached the Jitra line so quickly the anti-tank ditch wasn't finished. An initial probe ended with two tanks knocked out at about 8.30 before a more substantial attack was mounted after midnight on December 12th. The 1st Leicestershire Battalion was able to repel the attacks down the main road by dawn, but to the east, Seiki's forces succeeded in driving a wedge between the Leicesters and the neighbouring Indian battalion, the 2nd 9th Jats. One of the casualties of the previous day's routes had been Brigadier Garrett, who was missing, so on the 12th, the commander of 28th Brigade, Brigadier William Carpendale, took over temporarily. Believing the situation on the right flank to be more severe than it was, he reinforced it with two Gurkha battalions, using up the last reserves available at Jitra. In heavy fighting with artillery support, the British and Indian troops were able to contain the Japanese breakthrough, though an attempted counter-attack was repelled fairly easily by the Japanese. 
By this time, General Murray Lyon had decided that the Jutra line was now unviable, and his division should retreat. He requested permission to fall back to Garun, a position about 30 miles south that was in many ways superior to Jutra geographically. But General Percival and the other senior officers refused. Just like with the landings at Kota Barut, they were unwilling to give up such large areas after only a short fight. In the afternoon, the fighting intensified. An additional Japanese infantry battalion arrived to reinforce Seiki, pressing home an attack focused on the most exposed company of the Jats. Several hours of close combat ensued, to the point where the company in question was on the verge of running completely out of ammunition, being left basically only with bayonets and grenades. In the late afternoon, things started to go downhill fast for the British. A huge gap opened up between the Leicesters and Jats, and the road, the division's only escape route south, was coming under artillery fire. At 7.30pm, Murray Lyon again asked to be allowed to withdraw. Finally, 11th Division was granted permission to fall back at 9pm, by which time it was dark. General Murray Lyon now had to try and evacuate his division while under fire, in the dark, down a single road, with poor communication between units. As you can imagine, it fast descended into chaos. Vehicles jammed the road, leading some units to set off cross-country. Others didn't get the order to retreat at all until it was too late. A retreat became a rout, and the last units finally managed to disengage at 4.30 in the morning. The dawn light exposed the full scale of the damage inflicted on 11th Division. The 15th Brigade had been reduced from 2,400 men to 600, less than a single battalion of strength, and was essentially broken as a fighting force. In the 28th Brigade, the 2nd 1st Gurkha Battalion had been almost totally wiped out. 6th Brigade was more intact in manpower numbers, but this masked a huge loss of equipment during the chaotic retreat. In just 36 hours of fighting, the better part of an entire division had been driven from prepared positions by two Japanese battalions and a single company of tanks. It was a dreadful humiliation and laid bare the total failure of British decision making in the days, weeks and months before the invasion. Mark Steele describes it as one of the British Army's most unlikely and complete defeats during the entire war. He argues that poor communication and training had allowed the division to be defeated piecemeal. The Japanese forces never had to fight a force larger than two battalions at once, so the British numerical superiority counted for little. The defeat at Jitra marked the end of the first phase of the Malayan campaign. The British would now have to find other locations to attempt to hold the Japanese attacks back, with it now being vital to defend the key transport hub of Kuala Lumpur on the west coast. The battle for northern Malaya was over, but the battle for central Malaya was about to begin. This video is sponsored by Blinkist. Blinkist is a reading app that takes top non-fiction books and distills them into 15-minute explainers called Blinks. It's a great way to get a feel for the essence of a book without having to spend dozens of hours reading it from cover to cover. Blinkist has thousands of titles across 27 different categories you can read or even listen to as an audiobook, including some really great titles. Two of my favourites are Sapiens and Homo Deus by Yuval Noah Harari, books that really make you think about humanity's past, present and future in new and interesting ways. If you want to try Blinkist out, the first 100 people to use the link in the description will get unlimited free access for one week. You'll also get 25% off if you want to try the full membership. Thanks again to Blinkist for sponsoring this video.